one thing people with trauma want to do is forget. And Omori is a game about remembering. And remembering broke me. Mental Health has found media representation with varying levels of accuracy since the earliest days of human storytelling. From the Greek theater to more recent works like A Beautiful Mind, Good Will Hunting, and the infamous and downright despicable 13 Reasons Why. However, amongst the largest problems with the vast majority of these forms of media is that there's a barrier between how the narrative is presented and how mental illness is experienced. A story is a story, a series of events that lie beyond our senses and something that often happens to other people. Even if the story is reciting a memory, the events of said memory transpired in the past. It's unusual for stories to happen to us immediately as they evolve in the now. This basic truth about storytelling disallows access to a deeper understanding about and empathy for anxiety, depression, and trauma. And yet, this is exactly what the indie game studio Omocat has managed to achieve in their original RPG masterpiece, Ori. Omori follows a hikikomori boy named Sunny and his dream world avatar, Omori, exploring both the real world and Sunny's dreams in order to uncover the secret of his past and overcome his psychological trauma. The story of the game and the way it's presented in the narrative effectively allow for the barrier between other and self to be broken down, thereby allowing us to experience a diverse phenomena of mental illness and trauma as if they were happening to us. This video will have major spoilers for the entirety of Omori. If you are considering playing the game, I would advise going into it as blind to any spoilers as possible. If you don't mind spoilers though, watch on. I must also tell you that though I have done careful and very extensive academic research on the subject of psychological trauma, I am not a licensed clinician or therapist. The credibility of anything that I say in this video is directly derived from the credibility of my sources. Welcome to White Space. You have been living here for as long as you can remember. The game's introduction to Sunny's dream world, White Space is an empty and cold void. One of the later characters in the game will tell you that to be in White Space is to be nothing. It is emptiness, a home without warmth, a place to survive, but not to live. Just like Sunny's real world status as a hikikomori, a Japanese word assigned to those who lock themselves at home away from the outside world for years, Sunny, as a mori, uses white space as a place to escape from anything potentially triggering or troubling in his subconscious. This is established after checking Omori's journal on his laptop, which will show you that Omori has spent an eternity here, every entry concluding, everything was okay. This journal also tells you that when Omori isn't busy locking himself away in white space, he's visiting his friends. There's Kel, the comedic and competitive good-natured knucklehead, Aubrey, the enthusiastic and empathetic tomboy, and Hiro, the big brother figure. There's also Mari, Sunny's sister, the mom friend and Hiro's girlfriend, and Basil, the shy but thoughtful gardener and photographer. It's these friends that Omori spends his time adventuring with throughout the course of the game, fighting and befriending cleverly conceived characters and enemies whose unique half-time surprising qualities and personalities lead you to easily fall in love with this world that most of the game takes place in. Headspace. But the real world segments of the game are not so cheerful. Mari is dead. Sunny hasn't left his house in four years, and his friends, the same ones we met in Headspace, are broken versions of their former selves, still reeling from Mari's suicide. Not only that, but there's something that haunts you. It's only after Kel gets Sunny to leave his house, three days before Sunny moves away from far away town, that things slowly begin to crawl towards the better. Underlying everything is a terrible secret, one that Sonny hides from even himself. And slowly, the influences of this atrocious and repressed truth begin to seep into Sonny's dreams too. In the beginning sequences of the game in Headspace, you'll help Basil put back together his photo album, which got disorganized after a quarrel between Aubrey and Kel. But once you've finished, Basil will notice another photo on the ground. Picking it up causes a strange shadow to gather around him, and his fear-filled eyes turn red as he yells out Mari's name. But the next time you visit Headspace, Basil is nowhere to be found. The group elects to go off and search of him, 
However, while doing so, it becomes growingly apparent that the idea of this adventure was never really about Basil. Your friends start to forget what Basil looks like and what he likes to do, until he's entirely erased from their memories as you get caught in various other conquests. But no bandage can stifle an eternal wound, and there will be a time when his influence will bleed through. Just like the rest of the surmounting darkness in Sunny's subconscious, the shadowy apparition of Basil somehow always finds a way to insert itself at the conclusion of Sunny's oniric pleasure play and remind him of some piece of the harrowing reality he represses. Psychoanalytic theory suggests that your dreams are constituted from subconscious material, disguised in such a way so as to slip past the final sensor of consciousness, whose function it is to prevent you from encountering anything particularly troubling in your psyche. However, the intruding latent content of these manifestations hint in subtle ways the truth. It as Amori and his friends delve deeper into the world of headspace that Sunny's subconscious starts to embolden itself as it delivers its messages. It punishes and condemns him for escaping into this twilight world of fantasy, while at other times encouraging him to do what is necessary to overcome the twisted atrocity that holds him captive. Taking a look at the DSM-5, it's reasonable to say that Sunny suffers from PTSD. The DSM-5's diagnostic criteria for PTSD states that the individual must have had exposure to a potentially traumatic event, must suffer from one or more intrusive symptoms, including intense or prolonged psychological distress, and exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event, they must experience an avoidance of stimuli relating to the traumatic event, and must experience negative alterations in cognitions and moods. Checking through the list of symptoms available, it's obvious that Sunny fits the majority of this criterion. There's been quite a lot of discussion amongst fans of the game concerning a diagnosis for Sunny, with the most attention being paid to disassociative amnesia and disassociative identity disorder. However, it's unlikely that either of these diagnoses totally applies to Sunny for the following reasons. Disassociative amnesia is monothestically marked by an inability to recall important aspects of one's life, in its own regard often the result of a traumatic encounter. An individual with disassociative amnesia, also suffering from a disassociative fugue, can potentially wander off, and may even create a new identity. One YouTuber, Darl Talks Games, suggested this as a potential diagnosis for Sunny, due to Sunny's inability to remember the events of his trauma, and the possibility that he may think that he is actually Omori in the real world too. However, there are several technical problems with offering this up as a potential diagnosis for Sunny, the first of which being that neither disassociative amnesia nor a disassociative fugue are a diagnosis. They are symptoms, often occurring as the offspring of PTSD. As a result, there is an important distinction to be made here between these medical terms as symptoms and what is called pure disassociative amnesia in the critically acclaimed medical textbook Disassociation and the Disassociative Disorders, DSM-5 and beyond. Pure disassociative amnesia does not include the symptoms of the disassociative taxon of DD and OS, and is probably more akin to Kermit in the movie The Muppets Take Manhattan, wherein Kermit is hit by a car and completely forgoes his identity and everything else about his life. So to make the statement that Sonny suffers from the symptoms of disassociative amnesia is simply to say that he can't remember what happened. This is the focus of Darl's Psych of Play video, which causes that video to ultimately miss out on the true profundity of what Omori offers. On the other hand, full disassociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder, does not find sufficient support in the game either. Those in the Omori fandom that have assigned this disorder to Sunny have done so in response to questions concerning Omori's function, origin, and role in Sunny's psyche. But the general outview on full DID has been on the symptom of switching between personalities. This is marked by bouts of amnesia in which one will forget things that could previously have been remembered by an alter before the switch. The amnesia in DID is so prevalent that it's suggested that it ought to be among the essential factors a clinician considers before assigning the diagnosis. Ultimately, however, with so little officially established about the disorder, it's hard to put an official verdict on Omori as a symptom of full DID, so I'm settling for my original statement that it's unlikely. Nonetheless, as I am not well researched on such topics, I'll choose to put them aside as I discuss the thing that all of these disorders share in common, and the thing that Sunny certifiably meets the requirements for, psychological trauma. It's not at all uncommon for those with trauma to initially find themselves unable to remember the events that traumatized them as a result of aforementioned disassociative amnesia. When these individuals do begin to remember, it's often as an experience and not a memory. 
Doctors Judith Herman and Bessel van der Kolk both recite experiences with patients in their books in which the traumatic events slowly manifested themselves to the patient's memories in the forms of images and bodily sensations. In fact, it's unheard of for a person with PTSD to experience this aspect of their trauma in a manner resembling a coherent, organized verbal narrative, something Omori takes into account. Dr. Van der Kolk writes, The imprints of traumatic experiences are organized not as coherent logical narratives, but in fragmented, sensory and emotional traces, images, sounds, and physical sensations. These images and sensations, as fragments of the full experience, are encountered in traumatic flashbacks, usually triggered by something vaguely related to the nature of that person's trauma. We see this in the game in the phobia fight scenes that take place across the three days before Sunny's move. At the start of the game, after crawling out of the colorful room and headspace where you met Aubrey, Hero, and Kel, you'll find yourself at a crossroads. Exploring the paths above and to the side of you will let you know that Amori is afraid of spiders, heights, and drowning. It's in the real world that we come face to face with the embodiment of these fears. It's this same something that becomes an important leitmotif throughout Omori, showing itself in instances where something relating to Sunny's trauma is implied. As Sunny suffers panic attacks over these fears, more and more clues about the events constituting his trauma are brought into the light, except they still say nothing. They affect Sunny negatively, but just like something itself, it isn't understood why. It isn't until we've seen the full truth that we are able to reminisce and postulate alongside Sunny what the significance of these images and sensations are. Dr. Van der Kolk points out that experiencing a traumatic flashback and talking about it use two totally different parts of the brain. In fact, some of his brain scan research has shown that the brains of participants undergoing a traumatic flashback shut down Broca's area, the part of your brain associated with speech. This gives new meaning to the idea of an unspeakable horror. Omori captures the consequences of this neurological concept quite well too. We still experience fear when engaging in the panic attacks over his traumatic related phobias, even if we can't articulate why things like spiders, heights, or drowning terrify us. Omori puts us in Sunny's position epistemologically and emotionally. Operating under the guise of a third person perspective, the narrative conceals the fact that it's actually operating in the second person. If Omori doesn't quite understand what something means yet, then neither do we, and that's how it's supposed to be. The game pays special attention to several techniques meant to make us react to these situations with the same feelings of dread and despair that Sunny is shown to experience. Things like the music, visual elements, and actual gameplay of particular scenes make us feel very much the same way Sunny does, but these triggering manifestations are not initially items of understanding as much as they are appendages to the dreadful experience. Once again, a dynamic that rings true to PTSD. The music and the visual matter of the game, alongside particular gameplay features, thematically combine and are employed time and time again to add suspense and immersion to the narrative. As Omori continues on, this is only done more and more aggressively. Eventually, Omori and the gang's search for Basil leads them to the deeper well, the deepest aspect of headspace. To descend any lower into Sunny's consciousness would be to enter the incoherent realm of his subconscious. You're standing on the very border between headspace and the dark abyss of Sunny's repressed memories, thoughts, and instincts. This is the metaphorical representation of what it's like when in all your attempts at escapism, you actually get away. And for the player, it's an experience to marvel over. The anticipation, the dismay at what may be revealed next when you descend lower is hard to endure. When it comes to trauma, remembering the truth is agonizing, but the more horrifying thought here is what would happen if you actually let yourself get away from it. What would be left if all there was were your dreams. The end of this journey will lead to suffering, but if you do not face this, you cannot continue. This form, though it has not shown its true self, is evil. You will not see that unless you fight it. Omori seems to have constructed the structure of headspace after the psychoanalytic theory of Freud and Jung. This diagram seems to be what Omori follows as it physically embodies Sunny's psychology. Similar to Freud, Jung thought that there were depths to consciousness, with the unseen part of the mind's processes found in the subconscious. Things that are unpleasant to the eye of consciousness are held here so as to prevent one from troubling oneself, a phenomenon that often goes by the name of repression. 
Sonny's persistent efforts to actualize his redemption leads him to that part of his mind, black space. This netherworld plagued with suppressed horrors, cruel urges, demonic memories, and chaotic happenings yet to be formed in a comprehensible thought. Each door leads to a different personification of Amori's fears and memories, twisted through a grim lens. Whereas white space was sterile, empty, and controlled, black space is spontaneous, crowded, and full of uncertainty. It is here that one is able to see the true depths of their own twisted nature, and the twisted nature of life itself. Basil's important connection to the truth cannot be understated. In the real world, Basil acts nervous around Sonny, and in his observed bathroom breakdowns, points out that there's something behind him. There's clearly something that ties Sonny's guilt and Basil together. No matter how many times you conceal the path, the flower boy will always find it. Which is why in black space, Omori killed Basil again and again and again and again. The meeting with oneself is at first the meeting with one's own shadow, Jung wrote. The shadow is a tight passage, a narrow door, whose painful constriction no one is spared who goes down to the deep well, but one must learn to know oneself in order to know who one is. And indeed, who exactly is Sunny? Or perhaps a better question to ask is who is Omori? The keeper of the castle says that your soul is split, that you can only choose one path. Stranger in Black Space says that Sunny's reliance on Omori is a curse. The act of Sunny using Omori as a Dreamworld avatar is one of the most provocative world building devices used in the narrative, giving way to several questions which permeate throughout the entire game. What is Omori? And do his manifestations, role, and functions find representation in mental illness outside of the game? In The Lost Forest, Daddy Longlegs explains that Headspace was built over Black Space meant to seal up its influences. For a long time, it is said that Sunny himself explored headspace, but when the darkness of black space failed to abate, he chose to entirely forget himself as a means of protection, thus spawning Omori and using him to live his dreams out in attempted ignorance. And with Omori later getting skills such as Erase, alongside his tendency to brutally slaughter and mutilate Basil in headspace, it is implied that Omori functions as the guardian of Sunny's thoughts. He is the one that carries Sunny back to white space every time we expose ourselves to a part of the truth. In a disturbing reveal, Omori then goes on to ascend a long staircase and sit atop a red throne. It is in this moment that the full split within Sunny finally takes place. The struggle between these parts of himself, a battle over Sunny's right to see the truth. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that once Sunny has entirely remembered the truth, Omori weaponizes it, becoming the game's final boss. I said that this endgame dynamic between Omori and Sunny caused some members of the community to posit that Sunny therefore suffers from full or partial DID. I concluded that since there isn't enough evidence in the game to conform to the current clinical understanding of this disorder, it was unlikely to be true. Omori and Sunny do not offer up enough differences in personality to qualify them as differing personality states. Yes, on the Hikikomori route of the game, a route which sees that you never leave your house, you will eventually see Omori instead of Sunny in the mirror in the real world. But citing this fact outside of the context of prior events causes it to be misinterpreted as a phenomenon. On this route, it is only after a lethal encounter with Stranger that you'll end up seeing Omori in the mirror. Sunny has relied too much on Amori in this route, so that when he is brought into combat with Stranger himself, he's too weak to fend for himself. So after this fight, Sunny drags himself up that same red staircase and submits to Amori totally, denying his last chance for redemption as the alternative to a desperate escape. This interaction, alongside the way we've seen Omori and Sunny interact up until this point, lead me to believe their relationship is more representative of cognitive dissonance than DID. Dr. Vanderkolk further solidifies this as a viable conjecture by offering an interesting perspective on DID in the wider framework of PTSD in his book The Body Keeps the Score. As dramatic as its symptoms are, the internal splitting and emergence of distinctive identities experienced in DID represent only the extreme end of the spectrum of mental life. The sense of being inhabited by warring impulses or parts is common to all of us, but particularly to traumatized people who had to resort to extreme measures in order to survive. Many behaviors that end up becoming classified as psychiatric problems initially start out as strategies for self-preservation. 
In Sunny's case, it was using Omori as a way to entirely forget himself. But as Omori reaches towards the truth, the part of Sunny that is Omori panics, beginning the struggle between the part of Sunny that wishes to know and the part of him that wishes to hide and escape. Just as it is crucial for recovery to revisit traumatic memories and learn how to live with them without being overwhelmed by their recollection, it is also crucial that one revisit the part of oneself that developed the maladaptive habits that previously helped them to survive. That there are different parts of the whole self is an idea that has been in circulation for a while. This is why you can say that a part of you admires someone while another part of you is disgusted and irritated by them. But in trauma, the self system is broken down and parts of the self become polarized. Everyone has a part of themselves that is childlike and innocent, and in trauma, it is usually this part of a person that is hurt the most. The burden of pain, terror, and betrayal placed upon these childlike joys makes them toxic, parts of ourselves that we must deny at all costs. Guardians like Omori operate as a means to protect that part of the self. But this way of coping can quickly become maladaptive and tyrannical, typically as a result of the fear that one's unresolved feelings will crash the whole system if left unsilenced. Judith Herman wrote in her book that many of her patients felt as if their very lives were in danger merely anticipating their recollection of the truth. It is important for persons with trauma to sort out that confusing inner blend so that they are able to say this part of me feels worthless while this other part of me feels angry to establish why certain behaviors are employed as coping mechanisms, and to listen to the unresolved feelings that have arisen from one's trauma. The descent into black space marks the true beginning of Sunny's recovery, which has been happening quietly in the background up until now. I made the case earlier that Omori uses particular gameplay features in order to allow us to experience aspects of trauma ourselves. But if it's any less surprising, Omori also uses particular gameplay features to allow us to experience aspects of trauma recovery too. During the encounters with Sunny's trauma-related phobias, Sunny will learn different ways to cope with these various fears, calming down, focusing, and persisting. When it finally comes time for him to face the truth, he enters white space and smashes the black light bulb. This pits Sunny in direct combat with something, as it drags him quickly into the shadows. Slowly, he recalls all of the various techniques he previously learned through his past encounters with something. He calms down by taking a deep breath to regain some hearts. When something begins to take the shape of something different, he focuses to see it clearly. Something sways in the wind. You feel as if your life is in danger. Sunny remembers how to persist, preventing him from dying as something deals a lethal blow. Your lungs tighten up. Persist. Your heart beats out of your chest. Persist. Your fingers won't stop trembling. Persist. You steady and gather all of your courage and learn to overcome. The anxiety of this scene is intense, but just as Sunny must persist or lose this fight, the player also literally persists. These are very real ways of managing anxiety and traumatic flashbacks. Deep breathing especially activates the vagus nerve, which has the power to override the limbic system, the emotional epicenter of the brain that takes control during anxiety attacks. Something never takes any damage. You can't exactly make things of this nature go away per se, but instead Sonny overcomes and prepares himself to see the truth. The actual sequence of the truth relies entirely upon the idea of photographs and further contextual elements that add to their emotional weight. They aren't experienced in chronological order, and it's Sonny's role to sort these events into the order that they happened in. Due to the lack of exposition, this part of the game relies heavily upon the experience the player has. Although, through data mining, we can find out what officially happened, I think Omocat made the right decision by electing not to include these portions in the game. A traumatic narrative that does not include the traumatic imagery and bodily sensations is incomplete. Ari had just begun to attend college, and would come home too late to spend much time with Sunny. She would also devote major portions of her time to practicing the piano. Sunny missed spending time with Mari, and so all of his friends saved up to get him a violin. Using it as his excuse to spend time with Mari, he practiced with her for a recital that they would perform together. But Mari was demanding, and Sonny would get frustrated when he made mistakes. He hated the violin, as his lessons took him away from the time he'd rather spend with his friends. On the day of the recital, he and Mari had an argument atop the stairs, and he threw his violin down, shattering it. 
When she wouldn't let him walk away, he pushed her. Down the stairs she fell, snapping her neck on the way down, and dead when she landed. Basil, who had come over just moments before and saw it happen, took her outside with Sunny's help and tied a noose using a jump rope. Basil had decided to frame it as a suicide. But as they walked away, Sonny turned back and saw his dead sister swaying in the wind. You just shouldn't have looked. You just shouldn't have looked. Judith Herman states in her book that remembering and telling the truth are two essential steps in the process of recovery. She furthermore declares that recovery from trauma can only take place in the context of relationships. The bond Sonny has with his friends is one of the major themes in Omori. In Headspace, your ultimate attack is unironically the power of friendship. It's shown time and time again that Sonny values them more than anything, but is afraid to confront them. After trauma, most all attachment becomes a threat, your very biology reconfigured to make it feel impossible to fully trust again. But his friends continually swear to stick by each other. And it's these promises and hopes that propel Sonny forward, trusting in his own abilities and the capacity his friends have for forgiveness. His friends' words and well wishes literally give him strength in the final fight against Omori. But when you lose your fight to Omori, the game asks you, the player, one simple question. Do you want to continue? Not as in, would you like to reload the last save and try again? But as in, does Sunny want to keep living? One last time, we the player must persist and subsequently overcome. The resolution of Sonny's trauma finally comes when he uses his imagination, which for so long he had relied on for protection, to heal himself instead. shows the reaction of Sonny's friends to the truth. To be honest, as much as we want his friends to forgive him, it doesn't matter if they do. Forgiveness does not relieve someone of responsibility for what they have done. Forgiveness does not erase accountability. Forgiveness is simply about understanding that every one of us is both inherently good and inherently flawed. Within every hopeless situation and every seemingly hopeless person lies the possibility of transformation. We are not responsible for what breaks us, but we can be responsible for what puts us back together again. Naming that hurt is how we begin to repair our broken parts. Forgiveness is why this ending doesn't show anyone's reactions. Telling the truth means accepting whether or not people will forgive you. As a player empathizing with everyone in the group, you are made to consider whether or not you would forgive Sonny yourself, and ultimately, if you would forgive yourself too. At first, we cannot see beyond the path that leads downward to dark and hateful things, Carl Jung once wrote, but no light or beauty will ever come from the man who cannot bear this sight. Light is always born of darkness, and the sun never yet stood still in heaven to satisfy man's longings 
or to still his fears. You owe it to yourself to give yourself your own clean slate. <laughs>